Hi everybody, good afternoon. We're going to get started on today's webinar. Thanks for joining us. We're here today to talk about federal subcontracting, how subcontractors can get a piece of the pie. My name is John Williams. I'm a partner in our government contracts group and I'm pleased to be joined today by Julia DeVito, who is also in our government contracts group and she moonlights doing a variety of other things in the, the corporate and litigation groups and a little bit of labor and employment too. Hits, hits all the, the legs of the stool, so to speak, here at, at Polaro Mazzo. Those are our, our four primary practice groups, government contracting, labor and employment, corporate, and, and litigation. Uh, we're a boutique firm in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, our bread and butter is government contracting, and, and we have a niche within the government contracting space on small business programs. And that's the area we're going to focus on today. We, we work a lot with uh, large business primes that have subcontracting plan obligations. And so we're very familiar with what those obligations are, the rules that the large primes have to follow, how SBA enforces those requirements, and really how that can be used to a competitive advantage or disadvantage uh, in going after work with the federal government. So what we want to do today is focus on the small business subcontractors that work with those large primes. And help you as the small business subcontractor understand what the prime's obligations are so that you're better able to talk and market to those large primes, uh, you know, just have a better understanding of the opportunities that are out there at the subcontracting level and some of the unique rules and, and requirements and programs that apply at the subcontract level. So we hope you'll leave today with with a really good overview of federal subcontracting and how, as a small business, you can leverage your uh, capabilities and your small business status to gain work at the subcontract level. Um, and um, just a couple housekeeping tips before we get rolling. All the, the slides will be available. Uh, they're currently on our website, and they will be sent to everybody who participated in the webinar after we're done. So uh, don't worry about that. You'll get an email with a copy of the slides. And we'll be happy to answer as many questions as we can while we move through the webinar today. So please feel free to fire away in the question box. Um, we'll try to land with a few minutes left at the end so we can check out the questions that have been submitted and answer as many as we can today. And for those that we're not able to answer, we will follow up afterwards via email. So please don't be bashful. Uh, all questions will be addressed anonymously. Just feel free to fire away. Okay, so with that, let's set the stage a little bit before I turn it over to Julia on federal sub subcontracting opportunities. What does this market look like? It's a big market. It's a big piece of the pie. Uh, you know, there's a significant amount of uh, federal spending that goes to subcontracts every year. And just like at the prime contract level, there are expectations or goals that a certain percentage of subcontract spending will go to small businesses. And we've listed here on this slide the baseline federal small business goals. So, you know, this applies at the prime contract level, and this is generally the expectation at the subcontract level too. So, you know, it's a, it's a big market, and there's a, certainly a, a segment of that market that is reserved for small businesses, or the, the objective is to get it to small businesses. So, you know, there's a real, real big opportunity there. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Julia, and she'll talk to you about uh, how is the government doing in meeting those goals. Thanks, John. Uh, so let's talk about how the government did in fiscal year 2016. So of the overall federal subcontracting dollars that went to small businesses, that was 32 percent, 32.2 percent of all subcontracting dollars went to small businesses. So that was slightly under the small business subcontracting overall goal of 33.7%. Uh, 
5.5% um, of the subcontracting dollars went to small disadvantaged businesses, also known as SDBs. So this, uh, in fiscal year 2016, they met their 5% goal in that category. Uh, additionally, 5.7% of the subcontracting dollars went to women-owned small businesses, or WOSBs. Also, that goal was met. Um, turning to service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, or SDVOSBs, only 1.6% of the uh, federal subcontracting dollars went to that category. So that goal was actually not met in 2016 fiscal year. And also, in the historically underutilized business zone category or hub zone, um, only 1.1% of the subcontracting dollars went to hub zone businesses. So that goal was also not met. And um, we wanted to note that other than the small business category, all of these percentages declined from the performance in fiscal year 2015. I just want to make a quick comment because we did get a question here. Uh, the questioner is asking, what is the percentage of, of the subcontracting goal for 8A firms? And the, the answer is that 8A is part of the SDB category. So when we're talking about SDBs, that's including 8A firms. Thanks, John. And just a little more, a few more statistics about the, the performance of the federal subcontracting goals in 2016, or fiscal year 2016, I should say. Um, all agencies except HHS, the VA, the USDA, and USAID spent at least 30% of their subcontracting dollars on small businesses. So overall, agencies are doing pretty well on that goal to subcontract their, at least 30% uh, of their dollars to small businesses. Um, additionally, the SDB, which includes the 8A, as John just mentioned, and the WOSB goals are generally met by all agencies. But in contrast, fewer than half of the agencies met their SDVOSB subcontracting goals. Um, the best performers were the Department of Energy, Department of Labor, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and then the Office of Personnel and Management. Um, and um, the Department of Commerce, Department of Education, HUD, Department of Interior, and the EPA met all of their goals for subcontracting except hub zone. Um, the USDA did not meet any of its subcontracting goals except small business, and the VA did not meet any of its subcontracting goals at all. So there's some room for improvement for some agencies out there. Yeah, and I and I would add here that I mean, we're providing this information partly as just background to set the stage so you understand what the subcontracting market looks like, but it's also an indication of the type of market research that you can do on your potential customers. And we're gonna talk about that as we go forward and we have some slides on looking for subcontracting opportunities. This data is out there. You know, It's not just something that Julia and I have access to. It's publicly available data on how these agencies are doing both with their prime contracting spending goals and their subcontracting spending goals. So I think that helps you when you're identifying customer agencies to go after, you know, an agency that, for example, is not doing very well with its hub zone goals, which frankly is most agencies at this point, you know, presents a good a good marketing opportunity for you if you're a hub zone firm, and that you that you know that information ahead of time, I think, is also a, a you know a good thing to have in your back pocket when you're having those marketing discussions with the customer agencies as well as the prime contractors working with those agencies. Now, these subcontracting goals are important because Congress has determined that small businesses should be used at the subcontract level as part of the government's objective of maximizing small business participation. Sometimes contracts are, are too complicated that a small business might not be able to serve as the prime, but the government wants to make sure that small businesses can, can uh, provide services at the subcontract level. So uh, there's um, a statute that uh, sets out these uh, the requirement to have these goals, and then SBA also works with agencies each year to establish and monitor prime and subcontracting small business spending goals. And to make sure these goals are met, there are uh, 
regulatory requirements, both in the federal acquisition regulation, the FAR, and also the CFR. So uh, FAR subpart 19.7 uh, sets out the FAR requirements for the small business subcontracting program. There are also some um, solicitation provisions um, that we have here, FAR 52.219-8 and also 52.219-9 that set out the requirements for both using small business concerns and then uh, the small business subcontracting plan. Uh, the SBA also has regulations um, that we've set out here at 13 CFR 125.3 that outlines SBA's subcontracting assistance to small businesses and that um, includes how sub uh, the SBA will help uh, with subcontracting plans. Yeah, and I think I, I wanna just jump in and answer a couple questions that have been raised to make sure that we avoid confusion on the types of goals that we're talking about, because there are two different types of goals here. There are prime contract spending goals that apply to federal agencies and how much of their prime contracting dollars are going to different types of small businesses. And then separately, we have subcontracting spending goals. So how much of the dollars that flow down to the subcontract level are going to small businesses? So it could be the case that an agency has done okay in meeting its goals at the prime contract level, but the subcontracting that's going on at that agency is not meeting the goals, so because there's two different types of goals, and and we will talk as we move forward uh, in terms of enforcement and who's responsible, uh, who's at fault, so to speak. We've gotten a few questions along those lines, so we we are going to hit those topics as we move forward. So let's talk about the two key subcontractor requirements for prime contractors. So the first requirement is to provide the maximum practicable opportunities for small businesses to serve as subcontractors. So this is legal language, ma maximum practicable opportunities, but really it's the, the requirement to make sure you try to get small businesses involved as subcontractors. And this requirement uh, must be flowed down to subcontracts that offer lower tiered subcontract down for opportunities. So that means that if you are the prime contractor and your subcontractor has a subcontractor underneath them, a lower tier subcontractor, um, that, that first tier subcontractor should also uh, provide the maximum practicable opportunities for small business participation. And the second key requirement for subcontracting is to implement a subcontracting plan. And this requirement applies to prime contracts that offer subcontracting possibilities and are greater than $700,000 or greater than $1.5 million if it's a construction contract. And this requirement to implement a subcontracting plan only applies to large businesses. It doesn't apply to small business prime contractors or prime contractors on set-aside prime contracts. And this subcontracting plan requirement also must be flowed down to subcontracts that meet these requirements that we set out in the first bullet under the implementing a subcontracting plan uh, section, um, except if the subcontract is to a small business or for commercial items. So what is a subcontracting plan? Um, it is a written document that establishes a contractor's spending goals for small business subcontractors. Uh, so it will include several different things. Uh, first, the spending goals based on the total plan subcontracting dollars. So this is going to be usually set out both in terms of percentage and also dollar figures. Um, additionally, there will be separate goals for each type of small business. So there will be a goal for how much will be subcontracted to veteran-owned businesses, how much will be subcontracted to 8A businesses or uh, SDB businesses, as we talked about earlier, and women-owned businesses, all those different types. Um, there will also be methods used to develop goals and identify potential small business subcontractors. So how will the prime contractor actually go out and find any small business subcontractors? Where are they coming from? Do they already know them? What are the methods that they're gonna use for that? And then also how the contractor will make a good faith effort to comply with its plan. So it, the prime contractor should do more than just have a plan, but actually has to comply with its own plan. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julia. 
So a few questions I'll address before we turn to the next slide here, 11, that should be popping up on your screens. Uh, a couple different people have asked about subcontracting plan requirements being imposed on a prime contractor even though the prime contract is a small business set aside. That should not be happening. The, the, the rules are very clear that there is no subcontracting plan required for a small business set aside prime contract. Now there's a separate clause that Julia mentioned about maximizing the utilization of small businesses. That's more of a policy pronouncement than it is, you know, that's not a requirement to have a subcontracting plan per se. That requirement to maximize utilization of small businesses is going to be in most contracts and, and, and maybe in set-aside contracts, but there shouldn't be a, a, a subcontracting plan required of a small business prime. So if you if that happens in a solicitation, because maybe they're just cutting and pasting, you know, from an earlier version and that that kind of thing does happen a lot you need you should push back on that uh, let, let the the customer know that that's not that requirement doesn't apply um, and you know what because what we're talking about here is we're really trying to give you the, the the background to understand what the large business prime has to have in their subcontracting plan so if you if you better understand what the large business prime is obligated to do and what the subcontracting plan looks like, that helps you, I think, in your discussions with them because you're helping to fill a role for them and help them meet their goals in their subcontracting plan. And it's in the last few years, the importance of compliance with subcontracting plan requirements has really increased. Uh, there's been uh, a lot more focus on Capitol Hill, on ensuring that these opportunities for small businesses are real, you know, that we're not just saying we're going to use a small business in the proposal and then not using them. Uh, although I'm sure many of you that just heard that probably say, well, that's still happening today. And, and I'm sure that it is. But there has been more of a focus on trying to prevent that. And, and as we move forward, we'll talk about some rules that have been put in place to that end. Um, a lot of the large businesses, I mentioned that we work with larger contractors that have subcontracting plans to help them create a compliance program and to go through an SBA audit. And we've heard from many of those firms that this is the first time they've heard from SBA regarding their subcontracting plan in years. So there, there's definitely more of a focal point on this issue on the Hill within SBA, and that's that's flowing down, so to speak, to the larger primes that have these subcontracting plans, and that should ultimately to the ben be to the benefit of small business subcontractors. Um, and you know, the, there is more, uh, there are more penalties. The the stakes are higher, as we say here, you know, for the primes that have these subcontracting plans. So, uh, you know, it's something that they need to take more seriously and and from our anecdotal experience working with those firms uh, they are uh, the next slide here is just intended to drive home the the point that is really important to ensure that you're complying with the subcontracting plan requirements and that's not just for the prime even though it's the prime that has the subcontracting plan if you're going to be on the team you want your team to be successful and if the subcontracting plan requirements aren't met, that could impact whether your team is successful. And these protest decisions show that offerors may lose a contract, maybe you know, uh, the agency may reasonably exclude a proposal from the competitive range because they didn't meet their subcontracting plan goals. And conversely, if somebody did really well in meeting their subcontracting goals, that can be a decisive factor in making award to that firm. So it, it, it is a true discriminator and can be a competitive advantage or disadvantage. So again, it's important for, for everybody that's on the team, so to speak, the, the prime with the plan and the sub that's helping to fulfill the plan that, that you know that, that the plan is strong and that your prime has a good history of, of meeting its subcontracting plan requirements. 
So we've had, like I mentioned before, there have been several questions about, well, how is this enforced and who's responsible for this? And so um, a couple of, of responses on that. One is that it's the it's a, uh, an agreement that the prime enters into with the procuring agency. So that's one line of enforcement is that the procuring agency has to approve the plan and the procuring agency does ongoing monitoring of the plan. As Julia mentioned, the prime has to do reporting. Um, as I just mentioned on the last slide, your prior performance on your subcontracting plan can be a factor in evaluation. Um, and there are penalties associated with not meeting those requirements. So the procuring agency is one line of defense, so to speak, uh, in ensuring that these plans are entered into and, and followed. And the SBA uh, is another line of defense there. That they have the primary responsibility for auditing, uh, monitoring subcontracting plan performance. So if there's a, whether it's a surprise audit because you know the number just came up, or maybe the particular prime didn't do very well on its goals report for the most recent year, and that might trigger an SBA audit, but uh, so there are, you know, various ways that SBA could get tipped off to an issue, uh, or they may just be looking for it through their own, uh, through a surprise audit. You know, that that's their role. So that they will conduct uh, on-site visits, uh, and it's it's a pretty extensive audit. They look at all of the subcontracting plan documentation that the company has their internal policies and procedures. They're going to ask for underlying supporting documentation for all of the uh, small businesses that, that, you, that are being claimed, or if it's a commercial subcontracting plan, and if that's you know potentially thousands of small businesses, then the SBA might pick a, a sample set of, of certain small businesses that they want to look at. But they're, you know, they're checking to make sure that the prime is appropriately reporting true small businesses, you know, what are their processes for getting representations of size and status, how committed is the senior leadership of the prime to the subcontracting program. It's it's a holistic assessment and it, it will typically involve on-site uh, visit and interviews as well as reviewing uh, documents and then the SBA will ultimately make a, a rating, an adjectival rating assessment to the company's uh, subcontracting program, and that can have an effect on uh, you know the the, uh, the prime contractor's uh, evaluation for future projects. There can be penalties associated, as we discussed. So SBA plays a very important role in enforcement and monitoring of subcontracting plan requirements. Subcontractors can help primes fill multiple buckets. So I think this is an important point. There were a few questions I think asked early on to go towards this slide. So hopefully we'll answer them now. Um, this is really a marketing tool for you as, as a small business. If you are a woman-owned small business, as in the example here, the first example, then you are both a woman-owned small business and a small business. And the that means the prime can take credit for the spending to your firm in both the woman-owned small business category as well as the small business category. Or if you're a woman-owned firm and, SDV, and an SDVSB, then that's three different categories they could take credit for you in, woman-owned, SDVSB, and small business. So, you know, the the more buckets you can fill, the better, obviously. I heard somebody, I like this phrase, refer to it, well, and if you're everything, 8A, woman-owned, SDVSB, hubs on, you're a unicorn, and then you just really, you just totally knock it out of the box for, uh, for the prime contractor. So that's, you know, and I'll get into this a little bit more later. I mean, you're, you're obviously not going to mark solely market your small business status to primes. I mean, that, that's not going to get it done. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's an important piece of that discussion. And the more buckets you fill, uh, 
uh, you know, the more valuable you are to the prime contractor. So that might be if you're on the fence about, well, you know, we're hub zone eligible, but should we go ahead and apply? We haven't been sure. You know, I, hub zone in particular is one that I've really been championing because the numbers, as Julia was pointing out, you know, the spending on hub zones just declined so significantly over the last like eight or nine years. Um, you know, the, the National Defense Authorization Act for 2018, which, you know, will be finalized later this year. Ha right now, you know, we're guardedly optimistic. There are some favorable improvements for the hub zone program in that bill. Uh, and, you know, generally speaking, I think there's been more of a push here recently to improve and, and focus on hub zone. So if you are a hub zone or you have the ability to become hub zone, I think there's a lot of primes out there that that would be an advantage for them uh, to be able to check the box that I have a hub zone firm. But, you know, any of these categories, the, if there are some that you could feasibly get uh, to add another feather to your cap, it's, it's worth doing. Now, there was a proposal, I should add, there was a proposal to change this so that um, you primes could no longer count the same company across multiple categories. I, I think maybe there's a perception by some that that's sort of unfairly inflates the spending and it may be there are, it, you know, we're not focusing on growing the total number of small businesses at the subcontracting level where, you know, there, there might be fewer small businesses that help the primes meet multiple categories. And, and are we better off trying to grow the overall number of small business subcontractors? I haven't heard that that proposal has really gotten off the ground, so I'm not sure where that stands, but I just wanted to throw that out there that there at least has been a proposal to change this. But as far as I know at this moment, it, it still works like this, like, like we've got here on slide 14. So finding subcontracting opportunities. We did get a couple questions on this. Here's um, uh, some information for you there. You know, keeping your SAM and DSBS profiles up to date because that's where primes go to look. That's obviously important. But the the first bullet I think is one that whenever I mention this, a lot of people say, "Oh, I'd never heard of subnet before." Uh, so check out subnet if you're not familiar with it. This is where primes. So again, to go back to the SBA's role in enforcing compliance with subcontracting programs, when they come knock on the door and do an audit of a large prime, they'll one of the things they're looking at is what is that prime doing to try to find small business subcontractors? And if the prime isn't doing enough in the SBA's eyes, then the SBA is going to make recommendations. And one of the things SBA is going to say is you should start posting your opportunities on subnet. That's the purpose of subnet. Uh, so um, if the primes aren't currently doing it and they're audited by SBA, SBA is going to encourage them to do it. So going to subnet as a subcontractor is where you, you should be able to look for these types of opportunities. You know, some of the stuff on here is I'm sure stuff you're doing probably seems like common sense, you know, matchmaking and industry days and having a solid capability statement. I, I've definitely gotten capability statements from relatively young, small business contractors and thought that doesn't really tell me the story of their company or it doesn't tell me the story easily enough in a, in a quick, you know, one or two page summary. So honing that so we know who you are and what your capabilities are. And again, like I said before, you're not just selling your small business status. You're selling your capabilities first. I have heard a lot of the small business reps with uh, larger primes, you know, the, the small business liaison officers or SBLOs. Um, that's what they're referred to at the prime to the subcontracting plans. They'll often say, you know, don't just come in and tell me I'm woman owned and SDVOSB. First and foremost, I need to know what you're offering that helps me serve, you know, the, our objective on this particular project or, or whatever it is. And then it's a it's a added bonus if you have these other, uh, you know, attributes that allow us to meet our subcontracting 
goals. So make sure you're, you're pitching in the right order as capabilities first and status second. And I think that's good, generally good advice. Um, for l large contracting vehicles, you know, like this alphabet soup, you know, uh, literally soup or, <laughs> or uh, 8A stars or uh, CIO SP3, uh, you know, whatever it is, a lot of them have websites and you, for the contract where you can go see who holds the vehicles. Uh, so if there's a particular contract agency that's a good marketing opportunity for you, you, you can do some market research. You're not just shooting in the dark. Uh, and CMRs, let me make a point on CMRs here. So that, that stands for commercial market representatives. Um, these really, these folks at SBA, they should be your friends when you're looking for opportunities as a subcontractor. Uh, that's part of their job description is to help primes in looking for small business subcontractors. So uh, these CMRs might be doing the audit of the primes small business subcontracting plan. And like I said before, if, if the CMR concludes the prime is not doing enough to find small business subs, then one of the things they're going to recommend besides subnet and going to conferences is they're going to say, talk with me, I'll help you find small business subcontractors. I'll give you suggestions. And Julia is going to mention this at the end, but the NDAA for this year, 2018, the one that you know we're expecting by the end of the year, there are some provisions to, I think, sort of enhance or uh, you know confirm the the responsibilities of CMRs along these lines. So uh, again, I think it's just, they're your friends and, and finding the CMR that services your area that you can get in contact with and, and, and look for assistance from uh, is important. Thanks, John. Uh, so next, uh, we want to talk about what NAICS code will apply to a particular subcontract. So for these subcontracts that are set aside more or less for small businesses, um, there will be a NAICS code assigned to each contract, and then the small businesses have to be small under that size standard that corresponds to the NAICS code. But the prime contractor is the, the entity that has discretion to decide what NAICS code applies to the subcontract. It's not mandated by the agency or set out in the prime contract. So this can be an opportunity for a small business subcontractor to advocate for the best NAICS code for their situation. So uh, oftentimes there are multiple NAICS codes that could potentially fit the work that will fall under a particular subcontract. And if you're a company that is small under one NAICS code, but not small under another, you want to encourage the prime contractor to assign the NAICS code to the subcontract that will enable them to take credit for you as a small business. So you're going to want that NAICS code that is allows you to be a small business. Um, just another way that if you have a good relationship with the prime, you can use your status of a small business to their advantage to help them win the contract and get small business subcontracting credit. Yeah, and before I turn the slide, I do want to acknowledge a comment that somebody just made uh, that as I was talking about CMRs and other resources for subcontracting opportunities, I neglected to mention PTACs or Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, and the commenter said that their PTACs are also a good resource. And I had that in my notes. You're absolutely right. So to all our friends that are listening from PTACs, apologies for that. But the, getting to know your local PTAC is also an excellent uh, suggestion as you're looking for subcontracting opportunities. Another aspect of the subcontracts for small businesses is the reps and certs that a subcontractor is making in their subcontract. So um, if it's a small business subcontract, the subcontractor must represent its size or its status, whatever the subcontract is classified as, um, in writing to the prime contractor. And the subcontractor can either rely on its SAM profile or it will make a representation in the subcontract about its size or status. And um, the subcontractor must make this representation at the time it submits its proposal for the subcontract. And this can get a little tricky if you're not submitting a formal proposal, but maybe you're 
giving a prime contractor what the rates will be or you're exchanging some kind of information about the terms of the subcontract, um, there will be a point in time that will have to be considered your proposal and then you have to make a representation about your size or status at that time. Now, we wanted to note that the SBA's presumed loss rule applies to representations made for subcontracts. So this rule comes into play um, when there is a false claims act, misrepresentation, something like that, a, a, a situation where someone is misrepresenting um, these their size or status in relation to a government contract. And when you're making that kind of misrepresentation, the penalty is actually the value of the contract or in this case the subcontract and um, that's just something to be aware of that even if you're a subcontractor rather than a prime contractor you can still be hit with uh, significant penalties for willful and intentional misrepresentation of size or status so make sure you're always aware of what the rules are and that you're not misrepresenting your size or status uh, along those lines of um, proving or representing what your size is, um, there are size protests at the subcontract level. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but in addition to size protests at the prime contract level, you can actually protest someone's size for a subcontract in certain situations. So size, contra size protests can be filed against a subcontractor by the prime contractor if there's doubt uh, on the part of the prime that a, a potential subcontractor is actually small. Um, the SBA can also file these size protests and other potential subcontractors are interested parties if the uh, subcontract was competed and there are disappointed bidders, other companies that wanted to be a subcontractor for that opportunity, they can also file a size protest. And this kind of size protest must be filed within five business days of bid opening or notification of the successful subcontract offeror. And that's the similar to the rule for uh, size protests of prime contracts. So I, I touched briefly uh, just then about competition for subcontracts and um, there are certain circumstances when a prime contractor must select subcontractors on a competitive basis um, to the maximum practical extent. So there are there's some way wiggle room about it but um, you're supposed to compete subcontracts when uh, the contract is a negotiated procurement uh, the contract is expected to exceed $150,000 and the contract is expected to or excuse me not expected to be a firm fixed price time and materials labor hour or architect engineer contract and um, whether there is competition for a subcontract can help you advocate to a prime or uh, skew things in in a favorable direction for you as a subcontractor if competition will help you if there's already someone else who you think um, may be the favored subcontractor but you want to be able to throw your hat in the ring or if you don't think want competition because the prime wants to go with you then you can also skew it in the direction of not having a competitive basis for the subcontract Uh, next, we want to talk about when subcontract approval by the contracting officer is required. So there are certain times when the prime contractor has to obtain the CO's written consent before entering into a subcontract. And that is if the prime contract is a fixed price contract and the subcontract is under an unpriced contract action and the prime contractor does not have an approved purchasing system, or if the contract is cost reimbursement, time and materials, or labor hour contract, and the prime contractor does not have an approved purchasing system, or subcontract, excuse me, subcontracts under 8A sole source contracts. In all of those situations, the prime contractor would have to get the CO's written consent before entering into a subcontract. And because of this, you want to build language into your teaming and subcontract agreements that makes the prime contractor undertake its best efforts to secure approval of the subcontract if that approval is necessary. So you don't want to be in a situation where the prime contractor can say, oh, I tried to get the, the CO to approve it, but actually the prime contractor didn't make any effort to try to get it approved. So you just want to have that protection in there in case um, the prime contractor is trying to do something to get out of giving you a subcontract. 
Yeah, and to, you know, just this point on the 8A sole source contracts, uh, you know, obviously it would not be a large business prime that is getting an 8A sole source contract, but it's possible that you as a small business could be a subcontractor under an 8A sole source contract. Or you might be an 8A firm and you're, you receive a sole source contract and maybe bringing on a subcontractor. And I, I think it's often overlooked that the FAR clauses for 8A awards and 8A sole source in particular require approval of both the SBA and the contracting officer if you're going to issue a subcontract underneath an 8A sole source contract. I've had that issue come up several times here recently. So And, and in those cases, nobody had approved of the subcontracts in real time. I don't think anybody was really focused on that as a requirement until it was brought up after the fact. And so, and, and the FAR does actually say you, you can't subcontract without those approvals. So it's a good, good point. Uh, somebody else, as long as we're talking about things to have in your subcontract agreements, uh, like this commitment that Julia mentioned, we, got a question about whether or not a subcontracting agreement uh, typically prevents the small business subcontractor from doing further subcontracting. So taking a portion of the work to the subcontractor and, and turning around and subbing it down to someone else. I, I think it's definitely common that there would be that type of restriction in a subcontract, but I don't know if I would necessarily say it's typical. I think it, um, you know, that's more of a case by case determination, but it, it's common that you see that. I, I'm going to talk in a little bit about lower tier subcontracting and maybe why you might see a little less of that based on this new, new lower tier subcontracting requirement. But first, let's talk about increased subcontracting opportunities on set-aside contracts. Because this is a cool new rule within the last year or so that we have. Uh, it's called the Similarly Situated Subcontractors Rule. So this is an SBA rule. And what this SBA rule says is that you can meet the prime contract performance requirement that applies to a set-aside contract in combination with the work done by the small business prime, as well as work done by similarly situated subcontractors. So, you know, here again, we're not talking about a large business prime with a subcontracting plan. We're, we're shifting gears and we're talking about a set aside contract. So any set aside contract that's reserved for a small business is going to have a performance requirement. It's, for example, 50% for a services project. So on a services project, the small business prime has to do at least 50% of the services. But under this new rule, the prime could split up that 50% with a similarly situated subcontractor. So you know, giving you an example here, what is a similarly situated subcontractor? Well, if it's an SDVOSB set aside, then to be a similarly situated subcontractor, the sub would have to be an SDVOSB. Or if it's a hub zone prime contract, then you would have to have a hub zone subcontractor to be a similarly situated entity. Um, and you know, the subcontractor has to be a small business under the NAICS code that the prime contractor assigned to the subcontract. So let's pause there for a minute, because Julia mentioned a little while back that the prime contractor has discretion in assigning NAICS, the NAICS code that fits the subcontract. And that applies here. So if you use a similarly situated subcontractor to meet your performance requirement, it's really interesting, but you are not required to use the same NAICS code that applies to the prime contract. So in theory, you could have one NAICS code on the prime contract that applies to you as the small business prime contractor, and then you could potentially assign a different NAICS code that might even have a higher size standard to your subcontract, and that might still count as a similarly situated subcontractor, and the combination of the your work and the subcontractor's work can meet the 50% requirement. 
and there's no requirement on how much of the work you do versus how much of the work your similarly situated subcontractor does. You could theoretically do 5% and 45% is done by your similarly situated subcontractor and combined you're fine, you met the 50% requirement. Uh, so as an interesting way that this similarly situated subcontractors rule can be used to foster some creative teams to meet the performance requirement, you know, maybe when you just, if you're a newer, smaller, small business, you might not be able to ramp up the staff and other requirements to hit that 50% requirement yourself. Uh, but if you can get an, a similarly situated subcontractor and potentially even a larger, it's still small, but a larger small business uh, to help you do that, that's an, you know, an interesting way to to satisfy this requirement. Uh, and you know, when, obviously, as a subcontractor, then that gives you another marketing opportunity f uh, for set aside projects. I will note that this is an SBA rule; it is not in the FAR yet. I think the last that we heard earlier in the summer, we were expecting it to be uh, proposed into the FAR or maybe even an interim final rule in the FAR by around now. I think it was September, October. So they might be they might be on target for that or maybe a little bit behind schedule. It should be in the FAR soon. I personally don't think it should matter that it's not in the FAR because the it's in the SBA's rules, and I think this is the SBA's position is that you can do this. But I have heard anecdotally from clients who have worked with certain agencies that are not accepting similarly situated until it's in the FAR. So this is something that you might have to kind of take on a case-by-case -case basis until it gets into the FAR. And I mentioned this lower tier subcontracting a moment ago. so. Um, you know, in the past, the subcontracting plan goals that a prime contractor has were only satisfied based on small business subcontractors at the first tier, so directly below the prime. Uh, but there was an SBA rule. Uh, again, we're still waiting for it to be fully finalized and and in the FAR, I believe, but. Um, there, you know, this would allow primes to take credit for small business subcontractors, even if they're not at the first tier. So that's, you know, further expand. Obviously, I think as a small business subcontractor, you'd rather be at the first tier because, from what I understand, that's generally where the better work and the more profitable work is going to be, and you're, you know, directly in privity with the prime, so you're more integral to the project, but there, there will be, there should be more opportunities at lower tiers because of this rule. A mentor protege. We have gotten a, a couple questions on mentor protege. I think I, if I don't address them through these next couple slides on mentor protege, then we can try to circle back to them either at the end or or afterwards. But you know, it's we like to take every opportunity we can to mention the mentor protege program because it's new and, and, and we love it. And it's, we're really seeing a lot of clients taking advantage of it. You know, we were waiting for it for a long time and we finally got it as of late last year. And uh, it's been running uh, by government standards, I think very smoothly, very quickly. It's a, it's an easy, relatively speaking, application process and uh, to understand am I eligible uh, everything about it I think is tailor-made to to help small businesses and large business mentors partner together to go after projects go after set aside work and the point here the reason we're bringing it up now is because you can use mentor protege and what many people like to do with mentor protege is to then form a joint venture with their large business mentor Ordinarily, you would not be able to do a joint venture with a large business for a set-aside project because of the affiliation rules. You can't have a large business in a joint venture. But there's an exception to that if you have a mentor-protege relationship approved by SBA. And please make sure that you note that 
the mentor project relationship has to be approved by SBA before you submit your proposal as a joint venture. It's not good enough, and I've had some clients run into problems with this, that you have your application submitted for mentor protege, and then you submit your proposal. That's not good enough. You have to have approval from SBA for mentor protege before you submit a proposal as a JV. But if it is approved, you can do a joint venture with a large business, and that joint venture can qualify as any type of small business status that the protege has. So if the protege is a unicorn and they have 8A and HubZone and SDVOSB and WomanOwned, then they can do a joint venture with their large business mentor for any type of set-aside project in those programs. And that also counts at the subcontract level. So you could go to the large business prime and say, our joint venture will let you check the box for all of your subcontracting plan goals because our joint venture qualifies in all those categories or, or whatever categories it, it meets. So it's a, you know, there are a lot of good things about the mentor protege program and joint ventures under them. And, and this is another one being able to use it at the subcontract level. And I just wanted to lay out the steps in case you're interested in mentor protege and joint venture, you know, and just emphasize again, that you've got to get the you got to get the sequence right here. You have to get the mentor protege approved by SBA. Not just that your application submitted, but you're actually approved by SBA uh, before you submit your joint venture proposal. So you know the mentor protege agreement. The SBA they've been very consistent ever since that they took their first application about a year ago. They're approving them in roughly two weeks. I think they tell people eight to 12 business days. And in my experience doing a lot of them is that that's exactly right. They're roughly two weeks. The joint venture, you know, I, I would say if you have a month, that's your best case scenario because it just takes some time to work through the documents and forming the LLC and getting into SAM and all that good stuff. Uh, so you want to give yourself a little bit of lead time and then you submit the proposal. So, um, the mentor project is that key first step, and like I said, there it's really running pretty smooth and easy uh, at this point. All right, so we wanted to talk uh, about some of the protections for small business subcontractors, um, and we I think we've hit on some of these, but we'll just summarize all the different ways that the SBA and the FAR um, set out rules that protect small business subcontractors. So a lot of these are in FAR 19.7 and also FAR 52.219-9. So the first, and and also before I go through all of these, I, there's different ways that prime contractors are motivated to protect small business subcontractors. There's also ways to keep prime contractors accountable. And then there's also enforcement mechanisms. So a lot of these will fall into different buckets of how they will protect small business subcontractors. But the first is that the subcontracting plan, um, John talked about this earlier, and that the plan is between the prime contractor and the government. And that must include assurances that the prime will to make a good faith effort to use small business subcontractors to the same extent that it's set forth in its proposal. Um, the prime will submit a written explanation to the contracting officer if it fails to use small business subcontractors in the same extent that it said it would in its proposal. Uh, additionally, the prime will not prohibit a subcontractor from talking to the CO about any payment or utilization of a subcontractor. So this is really important that if the, the prime is boxing the subcontractor out um, in terms of payment or their opportunity or use as a subcontractor, the, the subcontractor can go straight to the CO. Um, and also that the the prime will pay its subcontractors on time and in accordance with the terms of the subcontract. And then it will also notify the CO if it makes a reduced or untimely payment to the small business subcontractor. Um, additionally, uh, for competitive small business subcontracts over the simplified acquisition threshold, which is $150,000, um, the prime must inform unsuccessful small business subcontractors of the actual awardee of the subcontract in writing prior to awarding the subcontract. So this will give the unsuccessful um, subcontract offerors the opportunity to file a size protest. Um, additionally, primes can rely on a small business subcontractor's representations in SAM, but the prime contractor can't force a subcontractor to use SAM. So if you don't already have a SAM profile, you don't want to set one up, 
you don't have to do that for subcontracting purposes. And also, I think uh, we mentioned this earlier, but a prime contractor's failure to comply with the subcontracting plan requirements can be considered a material, material breach of its prime contract that could subject it to damages and it could also have a negative impact on its past performance evaluation. So there's real consequences to a prime contractor for not complying with its subcontracting plan, which is just another way to encourage the prime to actually comply with it and do what it says it will do. And additionally, a prime contractor can't identify a small business in their proposal without first notifying the small business subcontractor in writing. So this is just another way to make sure the prime is not just making things up, saying they're going to subcontract to company ABC when they have never even talked to them and have no intention of subcontracting to them. Um, additionally, primes can't require subcontractors to establish their own subcontracting plans but they can still encourage them to provide the maximum practicable opportunities to other small businesses. And then the prime must prepare a written report to the CO at the end of the contract if it did not meet its subcontracting goals. So this is just another way to keep the prime accountable that they're gonna wanna try to meet their goals because they don't wanna have to write this report at the end of the contract and say they didn't meet their goals. And finally, any affected party can contact the SBA's Office of the Inspector General concerning a prime's performance of its subcontracting obligations. And quickly, we just wanted to touch on some recent subcontracting developments. Um, so there is a recent FAR provision that would require contracting officers, sorry, would require prime contractors to report subcontracting data at the order level under an IDIQ contract or either a single award or a multiple award contract. Um, this is a new thing before prime contractors only had to report at the contract level rather than the order level. Um, but this rule doesn't uh, create any obligation to create separate subcontract plans at the order level for these IDIQ contracts. Um, additionally, John touched on this earlier about the new similarly situated subcontractor rule in the SBA regulations. Um, the FAR, the corresponding FAR provision has not yet been updated, so there's it does not actually mention similarly situated subcontractors, but that is something that we're expecting to see in the future. And then uh, last year's and this year's National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, had two provisions that are relevant to our discussion today. So the 2017 NDAA created a pilot program to allow small businesses to gain past performance ratings as subcontractors. Um, this will uh, allow subcontract small business uh, contractors without a past performance rating as a prime contractor who have performed on a covered contract as a first tier subcontractor to get some kind of past performance rating um, similar to what prime contractors can get. But um, this pilot program has not actually started yet, so um, we're still waiting for that to get underway. And then um, John touched on this, but uh, this year's NDAA would have a provision that would uh, set out just statutory duties for what the commercial market representative, the CMRs, have to do. So these positions, the CMRs already exist and they're at the SBA, they're very helpful but now there will be statutorily defined requirements for them to help small businesses uh, maximize their subcontracting opportunities. All right, thank you, Julia. And, and thank you everybody for participating and, and sending in questions. Looks like we have a couple minutes, so I'll try to run through a few of the questions we haven't answered already. Too many for to answer all of them though, so those of you we don't hit, uh, I, we will get back to you by email after the fact. Somebody has asked or said, we don't use SAM, so do we just sign the Prime's forms to self-certify our status? Yeah, th as I think Julia mentioned, there is a rule that says they can't require you to use SAM. So if you're not using SAM, then you would need to make some type of a written representation of your size or status to the prime. And like you point, the questioner pointed out, many of the primes have forms, they want a form they want you to fill out. There's a standard form that SBA suggests that the primes use uh, to get representations from subcontractors. So 
Uh, most primes are probably working off of a similar sheet of music there. Uh, somebody asked whether or how is the percentage of work typically calculated and enforced? I, I had mentioned that there's a, a performance of work requirement that applies to set aside prime contracts. So the performance requirement is based on the total amount that the government pays to the prime contractor. So if we're talking about a services project, you know, where there's labor is really, really the, the heart of what's being done, then it's going to be the total amount the government pays to the prime contractor for the labor. That's, that, that's how you're going to measure the performance uh, requirement. Um, and I'm happy to drill down on that further for help the questioner if you have a, a more, a more a follow-up question on that. And in terms of enforcement, there, there could be audits by either the SBA or the procuring agency regarding compliance with the limitations on subcontracting. That's what the performance requirements are typically referred to as the limitations on subcontracting. All right, I think we're going to end there where it's 3 o'clock. Again, thank you very much for your participation, and we hope to see you at another one of our webinars soon. Take care.